Hi, everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of the O-Ship Show. I'm your host, Freddie Laker, and we're here to explore the world of ad tech and big data through conversations with industry leaders and visionaries. And today, we're truly honored to actually have a very special guest with us, Daniel Jane, who's the CEO of Aquifer. Daniel is an executive and entrepreneur who's been driving force in the ad tech industry for a long time. He's credited with inventing online behavioral advertising and pioneering internet privacy standards and data warehousing technology. He's got a very long list of accomplishments under his belt. He's founded and served as the CEO of Correlate, which was sold to JD Power in 2014. He was the CTO of Engage, which had its IPO in 1999. And actually, even later, he was the president of Dakota, which was sold to AOL in 2007. So we're very lucky to be able to pick his brain on today's show. He's got experience in internet advertising, privacy management technology, public policy, business strategy, software product management, and data warehousing, database tech, and the list goes on. At the end of the day, Daniel is an absolutely world-class big data expert. And so in today's episode, we're actually going to dive deep into Daniel's wealth of knowledge and experience to help find opportunities to succeed in ad tech and big data. So whether you're an expert in the field or you're coming up in the industry or you're an entrepreneur who's excited to explore this place, I think you're in a great spot to sit back and relax and set through on this amazing journey together on today's episode of O Ship. And here we go. Daniel, welcome to Ship. How are you? I'm doing very well. It's a pleasure to be here. And I just want to say it was a kick meeting you here today. I went to high school in London at a time when your father's name was all over the airwaves. <laughs> and uh, clearly he was Richard Branson before Richard Branson. Pro proto so. Richard Branson. But I appreciate you saying that. I'm honored to have you on the show today. And I'm always happy when someone keeps my father's memory alive. So pre Freddie Laker or <laughs> left an impression on you. And now yes. we'll, we'll see how the post Freddie Laker does <laughs> on today's episode. And hopefully I'll leave an impression as well. Daniel, you know, I've been very impressed with your background and you know, why I was excited to get you on ship show. You've got a lot of great experience under your belt. You know, I did try to do my best to kind of touch on some of those things today. Before we dive in deep into any specific questions I've got in mind, could you just share with the audience a little bit about what you're working on these days with Aquifer? Sure. Well, Aquifer grew out of a passion project, actually, where for many years I've been helping a company sort of between startups as an advisor. And the most frequent piece of advice I give is only spend your capital on things that create enterprise value. So Warren Buffett says, just because it's hard, doesn't make it valuable. What we like to say is just because it's hard and necessary, doesn't make it valuable. Because if your 5,000 competitors had to do the same thing, it's table stakes. Mm. So what we saw was an opportunity to solve the common problems that folks in the mad tech industry, that is MarTech and ad tech, to solve those problems more efficiently and to allow them to focus their efforts on their unique selling proposition, their USP. So what we've done at Aquifer is basically create what we call a marketing data platform as a service. And what we effectively do is we sort of sit between the horizontal big data technologies that are sort of generic and the specific marketing applications that the vendors deliver to the brands. And we actually provide sort of the solutions to the canonical big data problems in the middle. So basically we're the first and only company focusing on sort of solving the core problems in mad tech for everyone in the industry, as opposed to solving these problems for a specific point solution. So could you, could you it's a little a bit obscure, example? but it's sort of a new flavor of an old topic. Could you give a really practical example of how businesses might use this? A good example is that typically companies have to make sense of tremendous volumes of consumer linked behavior. It could be advertising impression data. It could be website surfing behavior and interactions with different digital channels that a marketer is managing. 
And all of that data comes in and it's often quite disorganized. And so there is a process we call collation. That is the process of sort of putting everything into, you know, sort of the filing bins, if you will, sort of to be organizing all of this data so that it's associated with individual customers so that you can do things like look at what did somebody do before they purchased your product? That organization process turns out to be one of the more time consuming and expensive processes that people deal with. And that's something we do as a service for our customers. And we do it very efficiently because of some proprietary technology. And then ultimately the point is with all this data, that kind of insight into behavior whether you're using that to drive more effective targeting or maybe to drive whatever that next behavior that you're trying to get out of them is. That's correct. One topic that people talk about in this context is customer journey analytics. Mm -hmm. So they want to understand the path to purchase. What was the customer journey? Well, that means that you have to organize all of those touch points by each individual customer. And it could be tens of millions of different customer identities that you're linking. So we help with that process. And then our customer focuses on what do the analytics look like? How does that integrate into the different marketing execution programs? Or maybe our customer has some machine learning algorithms or some AI that work off of that organized data. But organizing the data is something everybody has to do. And so we've built a platform that manages and organizes that data faster, more efficiently than the tools that one would normally use. So I have to ask, and I want you to take this as a compliment as a guy who considers himself pretty big nerd. This is a pretty nerdy, you know, intellectual subject, right? First, I want to ask, how did you even get into this space? Like if you go back in time, like how do you get started in ad tech, big data marketing, you know, marketing data platforms you mentioned are like, how does one even kind of get to the place you got now? And then I'd like to hear that. And then I'd actually, after that, I really want to kind of tie that together to how some of those things maybe you did on that journey helped you succeed in where you're at today. I know it's going to be a big answer, so I'd love to break that into two chunks. Sure. Well, to tackle the first side, I first started getting involved in sort of big data and customer data analytics and CRM at what's now Accenture. And eventually found myself at Fidelity, where I was helping run their big data environment for Fidelity Investments retail marketing efforts. And I got tapped in 95 by a fellow named David Weatherall, who some people will have heard of, who was one of the original dot-com visionaries who helped create something called CMGI, which was one of the original incubators on the internet. And they had done things like they had launched the first search engine, which was Lycos. Before MySpace, before Facebook, there was GeoCities. That was yeah. the first user-generated content company. And he was introduced to me and he said, I want to start an internet database marketing company. That was it. That was the only <laughs> guidance or setup there was. And he had looked at some of the things I'd done and said, I think you're the person to do it. And so I had to figure out what did that mean? what was going to be involved and coming out of fidelity and this sort of angles into some of the privacy angles of my career. We had just done at what, as far as I know, was the first privacy audit in database marketing. And i had had the idea of fidelity that we could pull all of the personally identifiable information out of fidelity's marketing database that we didn't need it there for what we were doing. We could put it aside. And when we went to mail a statement, then we could worry about it. So that gave me the idea that, hey, on the internet, we don't need to know who you are to make an experience relevant or personalized to you. So I immediately started looking at how could we do this and start to look at consumer behavior in a way that didn't require us to know their name and address and the things mm -hmm. that database marketing always needed prior to the internet. And so that was sort of the inspiration. and. At the same time, you know, we were working with Lycos and GeoCities and other big early tech companies. We also knew that there was an unsolved big data problem. So in parallel, we started building technology to create this new category of behavioral advertising, 
but we were also having to build from scratch the big data tools that didn't exist. There was no Hadoop, there was no Spark. You know, these tools that everybody uses today didn't exist. And so, you know, like a lot of folks at that time, we were building a lot of it as we went along. Yeah, I can't help but think back to parts of my career, kind of defining moments, the early part of my career was when I was involved with this pirate radio station called The Womb, and we turned it into one of the earliest internet radio stations in the world. And we didn't really know in full transparency that we were actually making one of the earliest internet radio stations in the world. When we made it, we were just taking kind of different things that we thought were really interesting. We almost had the epiphany, like, post-creation versus pre-creation. And I couldn't help but feel like maybe you had a similar kind of feeling as you had this one line brief for this challenge, but no one had ever really defined what that was right. before. And it's impossible to, you know, overstate, I think, how profound this impact of changing the way that we do targeting online now because of behaviors versus like you said, the traditional, you know, kind of, hey, we know your name is Jim Smith and you live at 123 Street versus you know, you're an anonymized identity that we're tracking via traffic. And we know what you do because, you know, what's the old saying? Actions speak louder than words. Right. I think that's the perfect summary, you know, for kind of behavioral targeting. Fascinating setup for this. How do you feel like those past experiences that you had then are shaping your success that you have today? Well, people often draw the line, they talk about crossing the chasm of worth moving from sort of like traditional corporate enterprise realms into a startup. And it's definitely a big transition. Not everyone can do it easily. It, almost everyone struggles of getting used to the fact that, you know, that there's a whole bunch of things that you have to do yourself that there might have been a separate department or division who used to take care of that. So you got to roll up your sleeves and be the chief cook and bottle washer as well. But, you know, what it does give you is a sensitivity to what the end brands and marketers are doing, having been in that seat, you know, having been responsible for those database marketing functions at Fidelity and then at Accenture working, supporting my customers and at Epsilon actually in between the two doing the same thing. It gives you an appreciation for what the end business problem is. And so I think that it's lots of successful entrepreneurs start off with an idea and they go and build it and they're very successful. But I personally find having been in the shoes of the client gives you an extra sense of, you know, the balancing of resources and, mm -hmm. and solutions that they have to do. So that's one piece of it. The other side of it is at Fidelity, fortunately, we were in a position where we were generally very forward looking. We were the first company, as far as I know, to do object oriented business engineering, applying systemic techniques towards business process re-engineering that was done out of my group. We had done our web presence in 1994 out of my group. We had at Fidelity, we had also been driving a lot of innovation in MPP, massively parallel processing database technologies. And the benefit there was I had just spent a year working with the five leading big data companies mm. to try to figure out which one was ready for prime time. So when I went to start Engage within CMGI, I had the benefit of sort of seeing how people were starting to tackle big data problems mm. and sort of figure out, okay, but there's a different way to do that now. And so it, again, that experience, you know, had two benefits. One understanding what the end customer problems were. And the second, have it being in a position where a lot of vendors had helped me understand what the current state of the art was and where there was room for improvement. One of the things I think is so interesting about this is we talk about trying to create as an entrepreneur, whether you're a leader or you're a sales and marketing leader within a business strategist, whatever in the organization, or you're the owner or founder yourself you try and identify opportunities in the market. And to your point earlier, you said, look, I'd sat in the business side. So you felt the pain points very directly, or you were working with the technology really directly. And that basically allowed you to have a really high empathy so you could design a solution. So you're basically creating solutions for problems that you were experiencing firsthand. 
I can tell you from my own personal experience that one of the companies I, I had or the only one that really you know, failed, I felt like I was designing something that really excited me. You know, I was building something for the media industry effectively, and I'd never been in the media industry at the time. In this specific world, do you feel like the, the world that you're operating in, do you think there's an even higher level of risk for people, outsiders trying to build solutions or create a new entrepreneurial ideas because of how complex it is? Or do you think that maybe there's an opportunity and you know, naivety here and not knowing, or is this specific industry too insurmountable to let kind of newbies in to designing big solutions? Does, does that make sense? Yes. So the ongoing topic is incrementalism versus radical change. Mm -hmm. And the big wins are from radical change. Mm -hmm. And often it takes someone from outside to see that. Now, almost always what they do is they build a team around them of people who understand the real issues and can kind of help calibrate or say, that's a great idea, but this is maybe the best way to figure out how we get it to market, right? So if it's going to be disruptive, by definition, it's going to be outside of the usual context. The great examples that, that people talk about, the joke is Henry Ford said that if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Hmm. Right. Yeah, fair right. Enough. And, and great stuff. <laughs> I think it's a little bit apocryphal, but you know, the Sony Walkman is often held up as that example, right? Which yeah. is there was nothing in the market, the idea of portable music that you took with you that you could okay. listen to anywhere was completely different. Everything else you sat in a room and you listened on speakers. So disruption, creativity, often it takes that person coming from the outside, but usually they end up bringing some people in who help them sort of navigate that change. The other side is often those ideas are too early, right? Mm. I, I, I have a little bit of a reputation when my friend's jokes is, he says, how many years ahead of the market is Dan this time? <laughs> and you absolutely can be too early, right? Absolutely. Um, so it's finding that intermediary point. What I would say is that and I sort of think we've done it the right way at Aquifer, is there's a lean approach towards creating radical change. And that is test, test, test. That is build something and see if somebody likes it and does it help them. And then you expand on it. So everything we've built here has been because a customer needed it, right? We had a vision of a new category, but we built the components for our vision in the context of solving real problems for customers. And that's a hard balance because there's a tendency for product teams to want to sort of go off and build the product and then come to market with it. And if you build it off in a vacuum, very often you've got a lot of risk that it may not hit the mark. And so, you know, what I recommend these days is You've got to build with a live customer in hand who keeps you grounded to solving real problems, even if you're solving it in a radically different way. I want to focus on the kind of radical disruption side of this for a moment, but I agree on that kind of the opportunity and the pragmatism and kind of designing around customer opportunities, basically. AI is top of mind, a buzzword of the year. I've seen a lot of technologies kind of come in and go over the last couple of years that I've been excited about, but I'm not quite sure is going to be quite as disruptive as this one. You know, you start taking AI, big data, machine learning, starting to think about the intersection of these things. AI in particular does particularly well when you're starting to deal with insurmountable amounts of data that is more than a human mind can comprehend. So I, my outsider's perspective is that this could be massively disruptive to your world. I'd love to get your point of view on how you think it's going to affect the industry that you operate in. Well, it's going to affect on several different, you know, planes, if you will. On one side, just in terms of the talent gap and the talent drought that we're hmm, talking interesting. about. That it's talent drought. So the idea that it's very hard to find the people who actually know how to solve these big data problems effectively. So one of the things that we're seeing with latest advances is an increase in productivity. You're not going to rely on AI to help you code the solutions, but it's going to give you a first and maybe a second draft, mm -hmm. right? 
So you're going to be able to leverage your talent and sort of boost their output of productivity or allow them to level up instead of worrying about, well, how do I solve this problem, which is sort of a brute force problem. So for example, it's going to help people tackle tech debt, which is all the issues you have to solve that don't directly benefit the customer, but you've got to clean up because version changes in platforms, et cetera. So I think there'll be a big boost in productivity. And I think eventually that's going to result in people being able to spend more time on things that are really innovative, really you know, game changers, if you will. The second aspect is just around the communications and the ability to tailor and adapt based on the massive volumes of data. There's a lot of processes today that require a lot of careful setup. So for example, in machine learning, we often talk about supervised machine learning, where we have a outcome that we know is good and we have a lot of data and we train that data to build models that are then used to make a future predictions. The advances that are happening now are going to be able to help increase the productivity of that process, allow it to be more agile, more adaptive. So I see a lot of, I want to say it will feel a little bit like incremental change, but what it's fundamentally going to do is open up a lot more opportunities for these technologies to be applied. The other side of it is I think probably the next generation, I think we're going to see is going to be self-correcting solutions. Mm. So, you know, everyone's talking about chat GPT and the examples I look at are examples where two out of three results are incredibly impressive and really useful. And one out of three results is just bonkers. It's just completely <laughs> wrong, right? Yeah. So what the advances I see will be the ability for these technologies to recognize, oh, that one's bonkers. I should try yeah. it again, right? And what will be interesting is, will that next improvement happen because the developers add that capability? But when do these technologies get smart enough that they recognize it and they figure out, oh, I need a self-correction mechanism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they develop it <laughs> themselves. Or self-awareness. It's like for humans going, eh, I might be making some stuff up right now. <laughs> so those are the examples that I see, but it's not what we call the singularity, right? We're not the point, you know, with sentience where we don't know what's on the other side, right? The changes we see, they're going to have dramatic, I think, economic effects in some mm -hmm. sectors. And we're going to see them become very pervasive in lots of different areas. But as one of my colleagues said, to some extent, it's just really intelligent autocomplete. And to another extent, really intelligent. Extent, I've seen actually, it actually, pretty, pretty there's more, stuff. there's something more interesting happening there, right? So I agree. Both these are, are valid, but it's really early days. We're in the first inning. Agreed. Yeah, agreed. When I asked a question, I was expecting some of the insights around how the data might get used, but it's really interesting. I forget because I'm not in your specific business, but I've heard people talk about it, how big the talent drought issue is and people are really struggling to find the right people to do the work and what a potential big opportunity this does to kind of alleviate some of that pain there. So that's quite profound, actually. Yeah, that's one of our key value propositions actually is, look, our customers have tremendous talent on their teams. Hmm. And what we tell them is, look, you've got a team of Michelangelo's and Michelangelo could have painted the Sistine Chapel in two years instead of four years if he hadn't had to spend all that time assembling and reassembling the scaffolding. So let us do the scaffolding so that your team of Michelangelo's can focus on what matters, which is painting the ceiling. I see a lot of these new AI advances that are getting a lot of the press right now as helping a lot in that process, right? Yeah. It's really helping people, not necessarily with scaffolding. Okay, maybe your team is drawing the lines and putting in the numbers and filling in that section of the ceiling with red paint can be done by an automated process. So I'm going to change gears a little bit. As you know, you're on the O'Ship show and you knew this would be coming at some point, but it wouldn't be O'Ship if I didn't ask you for a kind of O'Ship moment from your history. And for those of you maybe tuning into O'Ship for the first time, 
some of the original kind of spirit of the show was getting an opportunity to talk to experts and leaders and entrepreneurs like Daniel and say, look, what's a moment in your career where things kind of went off the rails for you and did not go as planned? It could be a major setback, could be a roadblock along the way. But I, I want people to kind of hear where things basically came off the rails for you that could have been absolutely cataclysmic and how you dealt with that. And sometimes these stories, we find people tell something that is like, I made this huge mistake and it changed the way that I was a leader or changed the way I did business. Some people share these stories and it's like, hey, it was a roadblock and I make these kind of corrections in my strategies or I wouldn't do this again. And sometimes people go, you know, I'm not sure if I learned anything from this. It wasn't very funny when it happened to me five years ago, but it's really, really funny now in hindsight. <laughs> and they're funny stories. Whatever it is, the floor is yours. You can take this any direction you want to go. But I would love to hear kind of an oh ship experience from your career. Well, one that comes to mind is a time where my partners and I, we all flinched and we probably shouldn't have flinched. So in 2010, I started a company with two colleagues called Ad Sumos, which meant to the heights and the intent, it was not the best name, by the way, and that's my fault. I came up with that name. <laughs> and I think I made up for it later on, but we had this idea. Oh, don't feel bad, by the way. I had a company called Laker now. That doesn't get much worse than that, in my opinion. So go ahead. Oh, <laughs> well, I think that's so better than Ad Sumo. So, <laughs> we'll, we'll debate um, that later. So we had this idea, and at the time I called it Federated RTB. This was actually the first company that's doing what's now well known as header bidding. And we had this idea that, you know, by sending the right signals to big publishers, we could tell them when they could do a better job of serving the right ad in the using the new, what we call programmatic advertising ecosystem, where there's automated bidders who bid on advertising opportunities. And so the idea was to cherry pick the really rare advertising opportunities from the top of the waterfall is the metaphor. There's a waterfall of well, you go to this ad server, then you go to that ad server, then you go over to your indirect and non-guaranteed, et cetera. And so we were building that out and we had Forbes as our anchor publisher. We were building up this effectively early, you know, type of header bidding ad network. And there was a company that had been working in what we call the SSP space and, and it was called AdMelt and they were bought by Google. And what we saw there was that we saw that we said, oh, that's the end because Google will take that. They'll put it in with their particular, um, ad exchange and, um, they're going to move up and they will basically cut off the air. They'll cut us off and there just won't be any opportunity to sort of do this cherry picking at the top of the waterfall. Well, Google so pushing we said, all the competition out. I can't imagine them ever doing something like that. We just saw that they were in such a strong position that it could make things very challenging. But we had this other idea, and this is actually a great lesson. You could only focus on one thing at a time. And one of the things that we did is we started this company with two ideas. One was this idea of federated RTB. And the other one was online to offline attribution, being able to see whether people who are buying things in the real world, did they see an ad for it first? And we'd come up with a privacy preserving way of doing that online to offline attribution to the level that Tim Forbes, when we were talking to him about this idea, we talked about both ideas. He said, oh, that's the billion dollar idea. And that stuck with me. So basically when Google bought AdMeld, we said, you know what? We shouldn't do two things. We should just focus on the Greenfield opportunity to be the first online to offline attribution. And so we sold off the header bidding business. And of course there were in the next five years, five companies entered that space and were all very successful. So Google did not shut off the oxygen. There was an opportunity there, but we flitched. What we did is though we sold off that business to a company called operative who then took it and commercialized it in a different way. But we took the, what was left and we rebranded as correlate correlate with a K and the inside baseball is 
for K anonymous correlations, right? Yeah. So, which is a privacy concept. And generally people like that name a lot better than AdSumos. <laughs> uh, and so then we focused on, but I wouldn't say it necessarily worked out badly for us, but I do think, you know, looking back, we flinched when we shouldn't. Have. So if the lesson is don't flinch and you were trying to give advice to a future entrepreneur or a business leader, how do you know when not to flinch? Cause it can't be just don't blink, right? There has to be a way to know when you should blink and not blink. So do you have any kind of feelings on how to do that? Like what the key lesson is? Well, I, I think you can't have your head in the sand. We flinched and just said, okay, we're going to just sell off that business and focus on this other idea. So my first advice is don't do two things at once. Do only one thing and do it well and focus on it. And when you run into that challenge, when Google buys ad mill, you think, okay, what new opportunities does that bring up? If I didn't have another horse to ride, what would I have done? And the answer probably wasn't necessarily to say, oh yeah, we should get out while the getting's good. But the answer is probably thinking about, well, what are the obstacles they're going to run into and how can we as a neutral party or an independent party or because of our experience, how can we do it differently and better? That's great advice. So I want to ask one more question and You've got a, as we pointed out multiple times, you've got a ton of history. Like you've been impacting the industry from the early days. You've literally created technologies and innovations that shape the way that people are working today. But when you think about the kind of, you know, next generation of talent that's coming up, whether it's ad tech, whether it's big data, what kind of words of wisdom would you end up sharing with any kind of young professionals that are just starting to come up through this industry and what guidance would you want to? Well, one common piece of wisdom that I agree with is certainly you have to follow your passion. If you don't have passion, then you're not going to have inspiration. The second thing is you have to solve real problems. Necessity really is the mother of invention. At Aquifer, we've built a completely different way of processing big data from what we've done for the last 20 years with projects like Hadoop and Spark. And it was driven by necessity. We had customers come to us with trillion record problems and we were running into roadblocks and, you know, credit to my team. My team saw those roadblocks and said, oh, we've had some success doing part of the problem a slightly different way. I wonder if we can use that technique for everything, right? And they just started gradually rewriting all of our, you know, effectively big data processing technology. So because of that, that led us to create a new innovation that is dramatically faster and more efficient than the open source big data technologies everyone is using. And that gives us a huge competitive advantage. But it wouldn't have happened if we didn't have a real problem in front of us with real data from our customers. And so that's really the side of it is that you can't do these things in a vacuum. And most important thing you can do as an entrepreneur trying to create something new and different is find a hard problem to solve with a real customer and go and do what it takes to get the chance to go solve it. I love that. That's amazing advice. Now, I want to thank you for coming on our ship today. It's been great to pick your brain. I know a lot of people who may be watching or listening to the show right now will want to find out more about you. They're going to want to find out more about your company. What's the best ways at first, I guess, starting with you, what's the best way that people can follow you on social or find you in, on platform? What's your preferred method? The best way is my LinkedIn profile. So that's LinkedIn slash in slash Daniel J. And um, Aquifer is www.aqfer.com. And the inside joke on that is that because we're a platform, there is no UI. So literally there is no <laughs> UI. Hey, that's Aquifer. pretty good. <laughs> I like that. Continuing our nerd theme. That's a great joke. <laughs> I'll take it. Again. <laughs> I like it. Daniel, again, great to chat with you today. I want to thank you again on behalf of the audience for tuning in. For those of you out there, frequent ship followers, 
whether you're listening to us on any of our audio streams or you're tuning in via YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, any of the other places we're streaming our video feed. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for supporting us. If you want to find out more of the places that we stream to, go to oshipshow.com. Uh, you'll see all the different links to all of our primary platforms. And the best thing you can do to support us, tell a friend, share it, leave a comment, give us a like. All these little things are really appreciated and they really make us motivated to keep bringing content to you week after week after week. I also want to say a big milestone for us uh, this episode. We've crossed 3,000 subscribers on YouTube now in addition to being a million plus view channel. Really feeling the progress. We're really feeling the support from our community and fans. And thank you so much for all of that. It really means the world to us. Daniel, one more big thank you from me. And we hope to see everyone on next week's O-Ship. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.